السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أَوَمَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا فَأَحْيَيْنَاهُ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا يَمْشِي بِهِ فِي النَّاسِ كَمَنْ مَثَلُهُ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ لَيْسَ بِخَارِجٍ مِّنْهَا كَذَلِكَ زُيِّنَ لِلْكَافِرِينَ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله وصلاة وسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أبيوان ونسجن السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. Today's parable is another parable from سورة الأنعام. Before yesterday when I took a day off and you could probably hear from my voice it's not my usual singing voice so. that I'm still kind of recovering, but please continue to make dua for my recovery and whatever I have, the wife also has, the baby also has, so we're all kind of reco- recovering together, alhamdulillah. Uh, but um, before I begin, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the reason I came to Manchester of all the places on the planet. In fact, there were, there were three candidates this Ramadan for where I was going to spend Ramadan with the family. And you can imagine traveling in uh, Ramadan is not easy. Right, so I decided to, and I don't want to spend Ramadan away from family, so I dragged my entire family with me. My parents are here with me, my wife and baby are here with me, um, you know, and just all of them have been uprooted to spend time here. And the decision wasn't an easy one. Um, the easiest decision was to stay back home in Dallas. Uh, the second choice was actually uh, Tokyo, and the people that are watching from Tokyo, I'm sorry. Um, but there was a pretty welcoming Muslim community that was making all the arrangements necessary for the family. And then I just kind of came up with the idea of Manchester. And that has to do with, you know, alhamdulillah, I've, I've had a chance to travel many places in the world. And to me, it's not places that are important, it's people that are important. Um, because at the end of the day, it's just Allah's earth everywhere. But to me, what stands out about places is not, is not the buildings or tourism. or you know, People usually ask, hey, have you gotten a chance to look around? I was like, I don't really look around. What am I going to look around for? But it's really people that matter. So it's people like you know, my younger brother here, Sheikh Fahim, who's much, much more senior to me in knowledge, but he's a younger brother. And I will troll him till my last day or his. Uh, you could tell, you know, I, there's easy to troll him because of his sense of humor. You saw the Spider-Man joke he tried to make. Um, so... Um, but it's people like him that kind of brought me to Manchester. And I must acknowledge that the, the kind of hospitality that we've received as a family here, the way we've been taken care of, even before I got sick and the family, uh, it's just been incredible. And we, we really feel like we're being treated like family and make dua for the volunteers and all of those that are helping us uh, you know, in this trip and making this trip very, very easy for all of us. Jazakumullah uh, khairan. But anyway, so let's begin by talking about one of the biggest uh, Meccan surahs in the Quran, Surah Al-An'am. And this parable is taking place in that surah. We already saw one parable here when the devils pull somebody down, if you remember, right? And they're just walking around aimlessly and their, their friends are trying to call them back. That was one image. Now we're going to look at another image. But in order to place this image, something I want to bring to your attention about this very large uh, uh, Meccan surah is that Allah keeps bringing up the sky and the earth in some interesting ways in the surah. He keeps bringing up light and dark, under the earth, above the earth, uh, okay, life and death. So these opposites keep occurring multiple times in the surah. And I want to give you a quick run through of how these ideas are being li- quite literally planted in the mind of the listener of Surah Al-An'am over and over again. From the very beginning, Alhamdulillah الذي خلق السماوات والأرض وجعل الظلمات والنور All praise and gratitude belongs to Allah who created the skies and the earth and put in place darknesses and light. So that's the opening statement, darknesses and light. Then you find in a couple of ayat later in the third ayah, He is Allah in the sky, uh, the skies and the earth. He knows your secret and He knows what you expose. And see, you know, what is secret is what is hidden in the earth or buried or unseen and what's exposed is what's above the earth, right? The, the, the secret and the exposed. Then you see 
ألم يروا كم أهلكنا من قبلهم من قرن مكناهم في الأرض ما لم نمكن لهم وأرسلنا السماء عليهم مدرارا uh, didn't, you, didn't they see how many towns we've destroyed before them that we stabilized in the land في الأرض and then right after that he says and we sent the entire sky pouring down on them meaning they used to get abundant rain so here again you see a very subtle reference to the earth and then the sky in history right um, then you find well oh, this is this is interesting one of the things that happens in surah al-an'am is that people want something more than the quran as proof of the prophet being a prophet the quran is not enough for them they want to see something. They want to see something something more. The claim of the Quran is that the angel speaks to the Prophet ﷺ. Jibreel speaks to him. So they're like, well, he speaks to you, he gives you the book. The book must be in pages. So can we see some of the pages kind of floating down from the sky? Can we see that? Can at least? If they if we if we sent the book down to you in pages that are floating down from the sky and they touched those pages with their own hands, right? They saw them floating like flyers, you know, <laughs> like uh, shooting flyers from the plane, right? That kind of thing. Uh disbelievers would have then said, This is just magic. It's a pretty good trick. In other words, even if Allah did that, they would have found a way to dismiss it. You'll notice another criticism that they say, okay, <clears throat> fine, you can't show me the book. Why don't you just introduce us to the angel? Uh, the angel speaks to you, right? How come we can't see him? <laughs> How come no angel comes down to him? We want to see the angel. Okay, either, either show us the book or show us the angel. Uh, you know, and Allah says, and had we did, had we sent down the angel, meaning in a way that they could see, then their matter would have been decided, and they would not have been, been given any more time. Some of you have been listening to my lectures for a long time. A lot of you tell me that my voice is soothing, it helps you go to sleep at night. So I don't assume that you remember things that I say. So I will repeat one thing that I say often in my lectures about miracles uh, in the Quran. Miracles are given to nations as their final chance. I'll say that again. Miracles are given to nations, previous prophets, as their last opportunity, final chance. If they receive a miracle and they still choose to dismiss it in any way, then that nation suffers the consequences of Allah's rage in this world. They get annihilated in this world. So when the Quraysh are asking to see a miracle, Two things Allah is saying. One, Allah knows for a fact that even if He showed them a miracle, they will still dismiss it. That's fact number one. Number two, what they don't know, they're asking for their own destruction. Because once Allah does show a miracle and you still dismiss it, you will be annihilated in this world. So even though they were trying to rush the Prophet ﷺ to show him a miracle, to show them a miracle, the way Allah phrased that in the Quran is يَسْتَعْجِلُونَكَ بِالْعَذَابِ They're rushing you to bring about punishment. Even though literally sometimes they were asking, why don't you show us the punishment? Other times they were asking for a miracle, but that was not any different from asking from the, for the punishment itself. So in this ayah you see that if Allah had sent the angel, their matter would have been decided, they would not have been given, given any extra time. ثُمَّ لَا يُنظَرُونَ Now, it, interestingly, they keep asking for something to come from the sky. The angel should come from the sky and reveal himself to us. The book should come from the sky and reveal, it, reveal itself to us. Allah says, قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ no, why, are you keep looking at the, why do you keep looking at the sky for some kind of divine answer for yourselves? Why don't you travel the land? Like everything you need to arrive to the truth, arrive at the truth has already been made available to you on earth. So again you see this interesting contact, contrast between sky and earth. قُلْ لِمَا مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ قُلْ لِلَّهِ Tell them who owns whatever's in the skies and whatever's on the earth. Tell them it all belongs to Allah. Again, the sky and the earth. Then you see, لَهُ مَا سَكَنَ فِي اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ Remember I told you, sky and earth, night and day. So Allah says, He knows whatever settles down at night and whatever moves about in the day. أَغَيْرَ اللَّهِ أَتَّخِذُ وَلِيًّا فَاطِرَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ should I take someone as other than Allah as my protective friend, the creator of the sky, skies and the earth? In the 29th ayah, 
uh, they talk about this life and this life being nothing but a play. وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا In 32, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَعِبٌ وَلَهُ وَالدَّارُ الْآخِرَ خَيْرٌ لِلَّذِينَ يَتَّقُونَ أَفَلَ تَعْقِلُونَ But then, the, the, after this, this play, ayah, which I will talk about related to our parable for the day, our parable is going to be ayah number 122. But there's a really interesting statement, a very heavy statement in the surah addressing the Prophet ﷺ. By many accounts, this is one of the latest one of the last even, arguably, towards the tail end of the Makkan period that this surah has come down, okay? And what's important to note about that is that all the arguments that they've ever come, come up with to dismiss Islam have all been documented in one place. It's kind of putting all of it together. It's, it's like um, the, the da'wah of Islam and the debate with kufr all of it just packed together in this one large surah. That's what's happened in Surah Al-An'am. <coughs> Other surahs in the Quran, you'll find pieces of the da'wah. One element. Well, okay, they deny the akhirah in this way, or they deny the prophethood in that way. And that, that's, that's what's been taken apart. But this is actually far more comprehensive. Now the Prophet is told, the Prophet must also be thinking at some point, the thought may, may have occurred to him, it's possible, that they keep asking to see the angel, they keep asking to see the, the book come down, something. If Allah just showed them, they'll just shut up. They keep saying it, they keep saying it. And by the way, the fact that they want to ask for a miracle um, is one of the last things they asked for. In the beginning, you remember, they were just saying that, that he's insane, or he's a poet, or we, we could say something like this too. We can make this up, Phew. we can make a surah. But Allah openly said, okay, you can make a surah, go ahead. Produce something, make it. You can say something like this, do it. Why don't you just do it? Yours will be far more popular because it's coming from all of you together. You can spread it among the people, They'll, it'll have far more impact, right? So go for it, go for it. It's just one man and it's just words. You could defeat words, they couldn't do it. And it's been years and years and years. Dr. Samir Rai pointed out very aptly, he said, it's remarkable to think that for the Quraysh, who are the wealthiest in the region, arguably the most cultured in the region, the, the reason they're the most cultured is because they travel the most. Right? The more you travel, the more cultured you are. They're the, the wealthiest, the most cultured, the most feared, the most intimidating, and the most eloquent. Right? And these are the people that saw that spilling blood and killing and torturing their own people was easier than just coming up with words that could defeat the Qur'an. <laughs> like why is it? They were willing to die, they were willing to kill for this. And they're willing eventually to even go out into the battlefield after the hijrah. They're willing to do that, but not come up with something that can just eliminate the Qur'an. And these are the people that you know what the Arabs were like. They didn't have tall buildings, they didn't have massive highways, they didn't have monuments and statues, they didn't have pyramids and a sphinx, they didn't have that stuff. What did they pride themselves on? Their, their language skills, their improv poetry. They'd sit by a night all night spitting out rhymes. Right? They do, you, you guys have like roasts, uh, hip hop roasts? They used to roast each other all night. They used to do one tribe roasting the other tribe. They did this stuff. They did that, and they were good. They were good. I mean, it's for, for people that are interested in Islamic studies and they get into Arabic studies and then they get into classical Arabic poetry, a lot of poetry is rated R or worse. And you, you're like, I'm reading an Islamic book here? What's going on? I never heard this vocabulary before. That's not in any Islamic book. Then you look up the vocabulary, you're like, oh, that's why it's not in any book. <laughs> that's what they were like. They were good with their words. They weaponized their words. In fact, their words were so powerful, sometimes it was just because of a line of poetry that tribes went to war with each other. They were that good. And yet, they're debilitated with this Quran. And at the end of it, what's the ultimate sign of defeat? Well, okay, fine, we can't come up with something, but why don't you show us an angel? Well, uh, uh, just show us the book already. This was, their ult this was the final draw for them. This is toward, when all the other allegations have failed. This is what they're resorting to, and that's what the Quran is responding to here. So the ayah that I wanted to share with you that's so pivotal, look at what Allah tells His Prophet. The Prophet is thinking, maybe, if I show them something, if Allah shows them something, 
my job will become easier. Since they're asking to see something, just show them something. <coughs> Allah tells His Prophet ﷺ, وَإِن كَانَ كَبُرَ عَلَيْكَ إِعْرَاضُهُمْ And if it's so hard for you to deal with their, them ignoring you, them ignoring this message, فَإِنِ اسْتَطَعْتْ Then if you are able to do so, and تَبْتَغِيَ نَفَقًا فِي الْأَرْضِ That you start digging a tunnel deep into the earth. He's telling the Prophet ﷺ to dig a tunnel into the earth. Or you develop a ladder and take it up to in, into the sky. Then you bring them a miracle yourself. That's Allah's way of saying, I'm not giving you one. You want to dig into the earth and get them one? Go ahead. You want to get a ladder and go up into the sky and get them a miracle? You do it. I'm not sending them one. Because this is Allah's way of saying, the Qur'an is enough. There's nothing you'll find deep in the depths of the earth or up in the heights of the sky that will over, overpower or be more overwhelming than the word of Allah. وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَمَعَهُمْ عَلَى الْهُدَىٰ فَلَا تَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْجَاهِدِينَ And had Allah wanted, He would have gathered all of them on guidance. So don't become those that are swayed by emotion. Don't do that. وَقَالُوا نَوْ لَا نُزِّلَ عَلَيْهِ آيَةٌ مِنْ رَبِّي So the miracle, the, the, we can't see the book, we can't see the angel. Can we see any miracle then? <laughs> That's the 37th ayah. Again, same kind of request. We want to see something. I want to see something. I want to see something. You know, there was a, my, many years ago, this is like in 1937, I used to be a professor of Arabic at a college. And um, it was Arabic. It wasn't Islamic studies. It was Arabic at a college. And I wasn't teaching Islam or anything. But uh, it's kind of hard to hide my Islam. So one of the guys, young guys, uh, he was uh, taking the Arabic course because people fill out their surveys why they want to study Arabic. And you know, if you ask a bunch of Muslims why they want to study Arabic, they'll fill it out and they'll say, you know, I want to understand the Book of Allah, I want to study Islam, etc. When you give, teach non-Muslims Arabic and you pass out the survey, why do you want to study Arabic? You get really interesting answers. Um, why my girlfriend's Arab and I really want to impress her family and. Uh, I, I, there are really good job prospects at the CIA, if you know Arabic, to enhance my career. I want to work in the oil and gas industry, etc. Like, these are the answers you get, right? This guy's answer was, I'm just curious about these people. And I, I asked him later, why are you curious about these people? He's like, I served in the military, and I was in the an, an Arab country, and I heard your... Uh, is it Adan? 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 Is that what you call it? Adan? I was like, yes, Adan. That's what we call it. I heard it and I was like, what is that? I just really want to know what that is. So he took an Arabic course just to understand the Adan. Right? So he just wanted to know. And at the end of it, he kept coming to me with questions about the Quran, questions. He was reading it on his own, the translation. And one of the things he said is, can you show me a jinn? I mean, I, usually when people ask me questions like that, I have really bad answers in, at the tip of my tongue. I just don't say them, but they're right. I was like, look in the mirror. But I didn't say it. I didn't say it. So, so. He's like, why do you want to see a jinn? He goes, can you show me an exorcism where some, like the jinn actually comes out? And, you know, because I just, I was like, so what's, where's this request coming from? He goes, I just want to see something from the unseen. Like I'm ready to believe, I just need to just see something. If I can just see it, I'm like, so you need to see a jinn before you can... Yeah, just, you just gotta, just gotta, God's got to just show me something. And I, I, said, I said this then, and I stand by this now, whatever I can understand of the Qur'an, it's very simple. Either you're following a religion in which your demands are met. Right? So God will do what you want. You want to see something and God will show it to you. Or you're following a religion where you've decided to do what God wants. You're, you're either going to move forward on His terms, or you want Him to work on your terms. And that determines which kind of religion you want to follow. And pretty much every other religion in the world, the, those religions are designed to work on your terms. You want to get married, you want to get a promotion, you want to get this, you want to get that, and you go to the religion, you go to the guy, you pay a little fee, they'll do a special prayer or you know, uh, light some candles or whatever, and that's going to work out for you. It's the, it's the spiritual Amazon for, for you. It works for you. This deen doesn't work for you, you work for this deen. You don't, Allah is not serving you, you're at the service of Allah. Right? So, he's not, he's, you, so you don't place the request for what, show me this 
impress me and I will buy your product. No, this is not a salesperson. It's not a sales pitch. If you don't want to believe, there's the door. The truth is from your Rabb. Whoever wants to believe, they can believe. They should believe. And whoever wants to disbelieve, they should disbelieve. This is the Quran's open invite. There's the door. Allah is not begging anybody. Allah is, he's, he's, it's so incredible that Allah is not saying, come, 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 please listen, please. No, 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 no. That's not your job. If they want to walk away, that's on them. You be kind and invite them, but no. This, this deen is not re reducing its dignity by begging people to come to it. It's not. See, the Prophet ﷺ was so concerned about the people that he just wanted them to be on guidance. He loved them so much. But Allah says, as much as you love them, this deen will not look like it's desperate for the acceptance of the people. It will not, that will not happen. The Prophet ﷺ, the leaders of Quraysh would barely ever talk to him. Right? One time, one leader of Quraysh comes and decides to talk to the Prophet ﷺ about Islam. And because usually it's the, it's the slaves, it's the youth, it's the, 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 the less influential of society that were gathering around the Prophet ﷺ. When one of the leaders came and wants to have a conversation with the Prophet ﷺ, this is a rare opportunity. Imagine the governor of a city or a president or you know, the, the uh, CEO of a <coughs> multi-billion dollar organization. Like let's say Jeff Bezos wants to talk to me about Islam. He wants to get on a one-hour phone. I was like, oh, this is an important opportunity. I should take this seriously. So while I'm talking to Jeff Bezos, you know, my, my cousin calls and says, hey, I have this question about this ayah. Can, can I talk to you for a second? And I'm like, can you just... I'm talking to Jeff Bezos about Islam, bro. Right? Rasul Sallallahu is talking to one of the leaders of Quraysh and his own cousin, Abdullah ibn Maktoum, blind Sahabi, interrupts the conversation. Now he's blind, he's not deaf. He knows there's a conversation going on. In fact, blind people know better than most people when a conversation is going on. Their hearing is extra sharp. So he knows he's interrupting a conversation. And because their hearing is so sharp, he probably knows who the Rasul is talking to also. He's still, so he's in the wrong. And the Rasul is so sensitive to his feelings, he doesn't even say anything. He just frowns knowing that a blind person cannot see him frown. Because that can't offend him. So he just, just, just the bulge on his forehead appears because he, he's trying to figure out how to keep this conversation going while not being rude to Abdullah ibn Maktoum. And just that much, and the Qur'an came down. No, no, no. No, no, no. This guy, this celebrity, this important person, is, is not important. It's not that important. The one who came running to you, wanting to remember something, that's, that's your VIP. That's Allah's VIP. <laughs> that's Surah Abasa. So what is the Qur'an doing? The Qur'an is putting, putting value to those, in those who value Allah. He's valuing those who value Allah. They're not going after the ce celebrity or the important person, etc., etc., etc. Religions in the world, you know what they do, right? Religion has always had this bad relationship with politics. So politicians want to get time with religious leaders. And religious leaders want to get connected to politicians. Why? Because one has power and the other has influence. And they both need each other. They both feed off of each other. And the Qur'an rejects all of this. What power, what influence. SubhanAllah. Anyway, coming back to this theme of light and darkness. وَالَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا صُمٌ بُكْمٌ وَبُكْمٌ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ And those who deny or call our miracles a lie, they're deaf, they're mute. In the darkness, in the depths of darkness. Again, darkness got brought up. In the, the surah began with, وَجَعَلَ الظُّلُمَاتِ nur. He put in place darknesses and light. وَمَنْ يَجْعَلُهُ عَلَىٰ صِرَاتِ مُسْتَقِيمِ Okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip forward a little bit. Because I've made the point about how light and darkness keep making an appearance in, uh, in the surah. But now I want to share with you, um, in particular, what's happening in this parable. Awaman kana maitan. As for the one who was dead, this is the ayah that we're discussing today. As for the one who was dead, فَأَحْيَيْنَاهُ Then we brought him to life. As for the one who was dead, then we brought him to life. Now, this is already a strange parable. Well, I'm not, we haven't finished the ayah, it's just the beginning. 
But what does it mean as for the one who was dead and we brought him to life? This is the same surah that describes فَالِقُ الْحَبِّ nawa, Right? فَالِقُ الْإِصْبَاحِ وَجَعَلَ اللَّيْلَ سَكَنًا The seed eventually tears open and pushes through the darkness of the soil and reaches the surface where it can be in contact with light from the sun. And as the plant grows, it inclines towards the direction of the light. It inclines towards it, right? And so this is the imagery of someone coming out, or something coming out of darkness, and then being pulled towards the light. And the, the seed on its own, if you're holding a seed in your hand, it's not alive. It's not alive. But does it have the potential of life in it? It does. So the imagery in the surah, if you look at it comprehensively, we get a different definition of death. Usually you find death is mentioned after life. Right? So someone was alive and then they died. If you look at this ayah, أَوَمَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا فَأَحْيَيْنَا As for the one who was dead, then we brought them to life. Right? So the starting point here isn't life, the starting point here is death, which is similar to a seed. The starting point is death. <coughs> so we're going to have to come up with a little bit of a better definition for death, a more Quran-inspired definition for death in this case. I would argue this is similar to sleep. One way to think about this. In fact, in Islamic literature, in the sacred literature, in the Quran and in the Sunnah, sleep is actually very comparable to death. And that's why even when we wake up from our sleep, we uh, thank Allah for giving us life after He had given us death. And it's interesting that on Judgment Day, we say, مَنْ بَعَثَنَا مِنْ مَرْقَدِنَا uh, who, ra who raised us from our place of rest and our place of sleep. That's your marqad, right? <coughs> now why is that important? It's important because then you're not describing death as the absence of life. It's life just hasn't initiated yet. All the tools, all the, all the mechanisms necessary for the seed to come to life are present inside it. Life, the potential for life is in it, it just hasn't been activated yet. If the seed never got planted, never got soil, never got activated, the life will never come out of it. But if you put it in the right place and you allow it to be flourished, then it will, the life will emerge from it. So Allah says every seed that tears open and works towards the soil, fights against nature, fights against gravity, fights against the, the natural state around it is death, and it fights against that and it pushes towards life, is actually something Allah is making happen. Now, clearly Allah isn't talking about a seed, He's talking about human beings. So how does this imagery work for human beings? You and I, imagine somebody before Islam. They've never thought about God, they've never thought about the afterlife, they've never thought about their purpose in this world. They're just living life. They're just, you know, they grew up, they went to school, they had friends, went to high school, they did what other people are doing, they're, you know, they got friends, they, you know, girls, parties, you know, a so little bit of alcohol every now and then, and, you know, some, some mischief on the weekends, this and that, then they got into college, university, or whatever, they lived their life, and then eventually they got a job, you're a young person, young professional, every Friday night, they're gonna hit the pub, Go, you know, go clubbing or whatever they got to do, right? And they just, they're used to that life and it feels, every weekend feels the same, every weekday feels the same. It's like they, they call it a rat race, right? They're just stuck in that life and they're just living that life and they feel like a zombie. They feel like they're dead. And they, there's nothing, they, there's nothing going on inside them that there's, there must be more to life. The, the thought doesn't even occur to them. They're just, in a sense, spiritually, they're dead. That doesn't mean that they're hopeless. The seed is there, it just hasn't been activated. And then you have a person who's living that kind of life, whatever that life involves. Whether it involves drugs, zina, alcohol, whatever it involves. <coughs> they're living that life and all of a sudden, Allah allows for that seed to tear open. That doesn't mean that the seed has grown into a plant that has reached the light, it just means it tore open something changed. When something changed, this person realizes this can't be all there is. There's got to be something more. And this person starts looking for answers. 
Sometimes they're like, they, they finish drinking at 2 a.m. outside of a pub. And they're just looking up to say, if you're out there, I just need help. I know people like that. I know people like that. That people were like drunk, depressed, finished partying. And they're like, if, if you are there, I think you're there. I need help. Can you help me figure out who you are? Because I can't even figure out who I am. They'll have those kinds of conversations. You know why? And their friends are never having those kinds of conversations because they're still dead. But this person, something changed inside them. They're starting to make progression towards life, right? And so they, when they make that, now look at the, the imagery, a woman can a maiten, fa'ahyaynahu, then we gave this person life. Allah is the source of all life. Allah put something in this person's heart. Everybody else around them is happy living that life keeping their eyes closed. But somehow this person says, no, I can't do this anymore. Something's not right. Even if they're doing it, their heart's not in it anymore. Now for the first time in their life, they're about to walk into the club or walk into the bar or walk into the party. And before they walk in, they're like, I don't know if I want to do this. Why am I even doing this? And they start, this, something inside them is pushing away from the gravitational force field, this was normal just a week ago, two weeks ago, this was normal. Nothing bothered them about this. But for some reason, guys, I gotta go. I'm just gonna go for a drive. No, thanks, I don't want a beer. It's okay, I'm just gonna... And they just go for a walk. And they're just staring at the sky. And then this person starts looking. They start searching. Maybe they end up at a Buddhist temple. And they sit there for a really long, long time, closing their eyes, hoping something will happen. And nothing happens. They end up trying to go to church. They try. I knew, I knew somebody who uh, tried to convert to Judaism. They didn't let him. The entrance fee was too high, actually, he told me. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, this is what he told me. <laughs> and, I said, even, and they eventually did let him convert. And they said, you're not really a Jew, though. Like, well, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> right? And they try different things. And then somehow, some way, when Allah sees that this person is seeking, then He lets them make one stop, another stop, another stop, another stop. And one of the things I've noticed with these people, I can't say this is a matter of fact, but certainly one pattern that I've noticed is that people that are searching for the truth, Islam is not one of their candidates. They'll consider everything else not Islam. I guess I can't, I can't, can't be that one. I'll look everywhere else. What, what else you got? What else you got? Taoism? Buddhism? Any other ism? Any, any ism? Can I just check it out? Any, anything, anything new? And then <coughs> when everything is exhausted, they're like, might as well finish the list. I mean, it, was at the, it wasn't even on my list, but at least I could tell myself I looked at everything. I'll look at Islam. And then all of a sudden, they, they, they're trying to judge Islam, and they realize Islam is judging them. They were trying to wrestle Islam, and Islam is wrestling them, pinning them down. I had a very close friend of mine, many years ago in college, who was staunch, staunch atheist. And he, philosophy guy, you know, 4.0 GPA, super sharp in philosophy. And he just, he said, I just wanted to, did not even consider the Qur'an. I didn't want to consider it. And eventually when I considered it, you know what I felt like? Because he was, because philosophy people, they love debate, right? And he's like, okay, I'm going to have a debate with this book. <laughs> That's how he came to the Qur'an. And he's debating this book in his head. He's having these debates with God in this book. He goes, I I literally felt like I was in a wrestling match and I was being pinned down every time and I'd get up and say, you know what, I'm going to try that again and I'd get to the next verses, next surah, next surah and I'd get pinned down again and pinned down again until I said, you know what, I give up, this is it. Like I didn't even want to, but I, that's literally what Islam means, surrender. Right, he intellectually had to surrender because he came to it sincerely, just looking for is this divine or not, and it, and it pinned him down, you know. A woman kana maitan, fa gave him life, 
And, that, and then, okay, so the person is looking for Allah, looking for guidance, but that doesn't mean they found Islam, but they're looking for guidance. What does Allah guarantee for someone who's looking for guidance? Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا يَمْشِي بِهِ فِي النَّاسِ First part, جَعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا We will furnish light for him. Nuran could be tafkhiman. Uh, so this could be uh, Allah will put a massive light for this person. You should know that one of the descriptions of the Quran in the Quran is nur. And it's also beautiful that in Surah Al-Hadid, which is it complements the imagery of Surah Al-An'am, Allah says, يَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ نُورًا تَمْشُونَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ He will put a light for you, Muslims, that you can walk with. And what's that light referring to? The Quran. And a complement surah to Surah Al-Hadid is Surah Al-Taghabun. فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَالنُورِ الَّذِي أَنزَلْنَا Believe in Allah and His Messenger and the light that we sent down. So the Quran itself is being described as nur. Allah will put revelation for this person now. Now they were, they were looking for something and this light, it illuminates all the questions they had. The idea of looking for answers is you're f trying to find something and it's dark. Now imagine the imagery, you're looking for something and it's dark, you can't really see it, and all of a sudden you have light in your hand. <gasps> I can see everything. Now I know the reality of everything. I know that that's what, in the dark, that looked like something good. When I shed light on it, that's a snake. I'm not looking at you bro, I'm just, I'm just pointing that way. Okay, so... <laughs> That's a snake. Oh my God, that looks so bad in the dark. When I look at it, that's treasure. <coughs> You're looking at the same thing in the dark and you can't identify it. You, with light, you look at the same thing, you can tell what it really is. They now have a, an ability to see things for what they are. And that's what revelation does. It makes, th it makes things clear. This is one of the ways in which the Quran is de defined. Al-Kitab al-Mubin, wal kitab al-Mubin, the book that makes things clear, because that's what light does. Light makes things clear. I can see your faces, you can see my face because the lights are on. The lights turn off, nothing is clear anymore. So now this idea, wa ja'alna nahu nuran. So you, you see the, the, the process here. The person was spiritually not alive yet. I won't say dead, not alive yet, like the seed. Allah caused some stir in them and now they're coming to life. If they show that genuine desire to come to spiritual life, then Allah will guide them to His revelation. This is وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا So Allah furnished a light for this person. Now they recognize that they better hold on to this light for dear life. Like the Israelites were told, خُذُوا مَا آتَيْنَاكُمْ بِقُوَّةٍ Hold on to what, I've give, what we've given you with all your strength. Just hold on tight to it. Right, so now this person realizes they better hold on to Allah's book. Like Allah says, وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ Hold on dearly to Allah's rope. Right, that's the same imagery of holding on to the Qur'an, holding on, because that's the light. Don't let go of this light. You let go of it a little bit, you'll, it'll, it'll start drifting away from you. <coughs> In fact, it won't drift away from you, you'll drift away from it. So you'll, be, you'll find yourself in darkness again. Can't afford that. And so, yamshi bihi fin nas is the next portion. With this light, he's walking with this light now among people. That's the next part of the imagery. He's walking with this light among people. What in the world does that mean? That seems to suggest, here's a person who has light in their possession, everyone around them doesn't have it. That's the imagery. The imagery is, everyone's in the dark, <coughs> and only one person has a light on. Now imagine this scenario. There's quite a few of you in this room. Imagine all the lights are off and all your phones are dead, because those are lights too. But one person has a light on in their phone. Where do everybody's eyes go? The one person whose lights are on. The one person who has light. If there's one person who knows which way to go, or if one person has something of value that nobody else has, it's the one who has light. And there are two kinds of people in the room. One kind of person says, oh, how come he has light? How come, how come I don't have it? Can I, let me talk to him. <coughs> Maybe he'll help me figure out how, how I can get some light myself. Back in the day, light was not a phone. Back in the day, light was a torch. And if somebody had a torch, what could you do? You could light your torch with it, isn't it? You can, get, you can borrow iqtibas. You could do that. So if you did have light, then you can give other people hope and they can find some light. At the very least, they'll just get closer to you, even if they haven't gotten in contact with you, 
proximity to you will en enhance their vision. <coughs> That's one kind of person in the audience. Here's another kind of person in the audience. Bro, how come this guy has light? Oh, he thinks he's so special? <laughs> I'm gonna go there and put out that light. If I don't have it, ain't nobody gets to have it. There are some people, they don't want what you want. They just don't want you to have it either. <laughs> right? Allah will describe those people too. They want to blow out Allah's light with their mouths. It's a later parable that's coming. But that's the same idea. This person now, he was dead, something stirred up inside them. <coughs> they found themselves coming to Islam with this light. That's not enough. Now they're walking among people. You know what that means? They're not hiding their Islam. They're walking among people. And you can tell there's a difference between the one who has light and everybody else who's in the dark. You can immediately tell. So they are standing out now in society. They stand out. They're totally okay being different than everyone else. Because they see that they have light and they appreciate that, they won't let it go. Now everyone around them says, why are you being weird bro? What's this light? Just turn it off. What? You, well, the rest of us are crazy? Is darkness really that bad? Really? Your mom had darkness? Your grandpa had darkness? Your older brother has darkness? Is it really that bad? You're better than everyone, huh? And he still doesn't let it go. You know, darkness, one of the things about it, the, the imagery of darkness here, is if you're in the dark for a really long time, and then somebody turns all the lights on, what happens to your eyes? Turn it off! This person has light, and the people who are comfortable in the dark, what happens to them? Ah, just, come on! They can't stand the presence of someone who has light, because they're really comfortable being in the dark. This is the life of a person who comes towards Allah when they start walking with the word of Allah and standing by it and they're interacting with a society that has darkness but they won't let go of their identity and they won't let go of the light that Allah has given them and it shines right through them there will be people in the office that are like ah, Muhammad could you pray somewhere else? You know? There's gonna be, they can't stand the presence it bothers them. It hurts them. They don't want to see any, any of it. This might even happen in some families. Hey, there's an Eid party. You're invited. Can you not wear hijab? Because we want to be normal this time. Can you not? Okay, there's going to be this wedding. Everybody's invited. Can you just not leave when all the crazy stuff starts, when the fun begins? Can you just stay when the fun begins? It's awkward. You're making us feel bad. Can you just accept the darkness, please? Isn't that what, what that is? This person is being described as being in the, in the, encircled by people that are comfortable in the dark, but they don't run from those people. They're walking among them. The light's enough for them to be able to engage with society to be, and continue to engage with them. The people might run from them, they're not going to run from the people. There's a powerful example also of our philosophy as Muslims. Muslims are like, oh, we have to move to an Islamic environment. We are living in a kafir country. We're living in a kafir society. We have a kafir job. I'm eating, uh, you know, I'm sitting at kafir tables and kafir apartments and kafir. Shut up. The entire premise of this ayah is that Allah has given you a light and the purpose of you having light was so you could, you could go and illuminate an area where everybody is engulfed in darkness. If everybody had a light and you had a light, you're not contributing in any way, <laughs> actually, because it already exists. Yamshi bihi fin nas. There's actually really powerful imagery here of non-conformity, which I want to talk to you about a little bit. One of the most important, one of the most powerful um, forces in the world is conformity. Especially young people here, listen to this carefully. Conformity means 
you want to be like everyone else because that's what's acceptable. You create a standard. The only, way, the only thing that's acceptable is if you look like everyone else, you talk like everyone else, you dress like everyone else, you behave like everyone else because that's what everyone re has decided is normal. So if you want to be normal, you better be like everyone else. And these ayat are telling you, normal is usually dark. Normal is, the majority of people are usually in darkness. You have to be comfortable holding on to light, even if all the people in the darkness are weirded out by you. And their eyes are ah, un uncomfortable. They experience discomfort by your presence. You, should, you, you become comfortable with that. Now Allah says on the flip side, Is this person example like someone who's, who, the, is this the equivalent of someone who is in depths of darkness, in the layers of darkness, that he won't be coming out of? So on the one hand is a person who decides to walk through darkness with light in their hand. On the, other, on the flip side, <coughs> someone who will stay in darkness, not to come out of it. One of the most interesting observations about this ayah, from the, uh, as a contrast from the previous, is at ta'addi wal luzum. So you notice the person was dead, Allah says, we brought them to life. And then Allah says, and we put a, a light, furnished them with a light. Then he says, and then that person walks with that light among the people. What does that mean? The bringing to life, Allah takes credit. Providing the light, Allah takes credit. Walking among the people with light, the person had to make the effort themselves. Allah didn't say, I make him walk. No, 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 now he walks on his own. But Allah initiated that. Allah initiated by giving him life, providing him the light. But the walking he had to do on his own. If you look at the flip side, Allah did not mention himself. On the flip side, Allah says, someone kamathaluhu fi dhulumat. As, as opposed to someone, the example of someone who is in darknesses. If you follow the previous imagery, remember the devils were able to pull him down into a dark area? That's all on his own. He did this to himself. <coughs> and then Allah didn't say, oh, and Allah will not let him come out. That would have been, وَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِمُخْرِجِهِ مِنْهَا Allah will not be pulling him out of that darkness. No, no, no. لَيْسَ بِخَارِجٍ مِنْهَا He won't be coming out of it. خارج is lazim. يعني لا يخرج منها هو He won't come out of it. It's not that Allah won't let him come out. He doesn't want to come out. Which is interesting because the one who's moving towards light or the one who's moving towards life and the one who's walking among people in darkness is making a lot of effort. It's like going upstream. It's going against what everybody else is doing. And this person is actually comfortable in the dark. He doesn't want to come out of it. He wants to stay in the dark. It's comfortable here. Why in the world would somebody be comfortable with darkness? I gave you an example of somebody who just lives their life sort of carefree and you know they one Friday night is you know pub night Saturday night is club night or whatever it is right one weekend the next weekend the next weekend the next weekend and these are the same people that are depressed these are the same people that are taking anti-anxiety pills these are the same people that are having hangovers and all kinds of problems these are the same people who can't be in any steady relationships these are the same people that have trouble trusting anybody or anybody trusting them <coughs> they have all these issues and every, every one of their friends has some kind of an agenda they feel isolated, lonely, misunderstood, depressed constantly but they're doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again you know why? because they're habituated they go from one darkness to the next darkness to the next darkness and they're like, well, I mean what else do I, what am I supposed to do? this is what life is this is what everybody does, what do you want to be weird? hey, let's not go out on Friday night why? don't you have a life? You should have a life. Because that's how they defined life. Even if that life brings them many troubles, brings them many crises, brings them many sadnesses, that doesn't matter. It's just what you're supposed to do. Isn't that itself a kind of surrender? Isn't that itself a kind of ibadah? When you're like, you know, for Jum'ah, for, uh, for us, Salatul Jum'ah is, you gotta show up for Salatul Jum'ah. For them, Friday night, it's like, you, you gotta go party Friday night. It's like, Ibadah, you can't miss it. What do you mean it's Friday night? Astaghfirullah <laughs> shaitan! 
<laughs> How am I going to miss Friday night? Allah is basically the Qur'an's teaching of philosophy, which I'll elaborate tomorrow inshallah when we get to the next parable. And that philosophy is, either you're a slave to God, either you decide to enslave yourself to Allah, or you will be enslaved to someone other than Allah. But you will be enslaved. And only one of them is actual freedom. If you're enslaved to Allah, you will be free from your culture. You'll be free from peer pressure. You'll be free from social expectations. You'll be free from your own bad habits. You'll be free from your lower self. It's a freedom from all things because you enslaved yourself to Allah. If you don't enslave yourself to Allah, you will be enslaved to trends, to fashion, to the group that you belong to. You'll be enslaved to family expectations, corporate expectations. You'll be enslaved to you know, social media expectations, influencer expectations. You will find other gods to enslave yourselves to. And your behavior won't actually be yours, it will be dictated by one of those false gods. That's what it will be dictated by. Either you're enslaved to Allah and you're loyal to your own conscience, or you're enslaved to people or other trends or other forces, and they dictate everything that you do. You have to decide which one, which one you're, you're going to end up, which side you're going to end up. So Allah says, "Laysa bi kharij minha." The last thing from this ayah that I'd like to share with you briefly: "Kadalika zuyina lil kafirina ma kanu yamadun." That is how we've beautified for disbelievers what they've been doing. <coughs> what a strange conclusion to this ayah. To beautify for disbelievers, Allah says, "That is how." Whatever disbelievers have been doing has been beautified for them. That's the more literal translation. What does beauty have to do with anything? Purpose. Think, have you heard the terms style and substance? Okay, if you don't know the terms, look them up. Style and substance. Um, if somebody's delivering a, a message, it should have substance, right? Uh, and then, of course, it should have an, have an effective style. So. Good communication is a combination of style and substance. But some people are only obsessed with style, which means beauty. Only beauty. And others are only obsessed with substance. Though an easy example of that is the engineering department and the design department. The engineering department is obsessed with substance, function. And the design department is obsessed with style. And you have to kind of bring them together. One of the things Allah is doing in this ayah is Allah is describing the people who found light they are more driven by substance, purpose. And what's interesting is what used to be ugly in the dark becomes beautiful in the morning. So if you go to a beautiful island palm trees, woods, forest and, a, and an ocean in front of you but you go there at 3 a.m. with no lights on I can guarantee you it's a terrifying place. And that same place by morning, oh, oh my God, if this is on earth, what does Jannah look like? The only difference between the most terrifying place and the most beautiful place is the presence of what? Light. While light is actually mainly directed towards substance, it's supposed to lead you to a destination, light is also the only way by which we can see beauty in this world. That's how beauty is appreciated in this world. But on the flip side, there are people who don't care about substance. All they care about is beauty, style. And Allah says, these deeds that they do, someone has convinced them. Somehow they've been convinced that these deeds that they do are beautiful. And they'll keep doing them and stay in the dark. And they don't even know why they're doing it. Because it just, it's just what you're supposed to do. It's beautified to them. That's all that, there's no purpose behind it. You can't talk about a purpose, because it's not about purpose, it's about tazyin, it's about beauty. <laughs> so there's a contrast made about between the people of substance, who end up finding beauty anyway, and the people that just want style, who end up staying in the dark and make their lives uglier. Summarizing that, beautiful, that incredible point, when we live a life of purpose, life gets beautiful. Life itself gets beautiful. And when we live a life running after beauty, 
life itself gets ugly. Life itself gets surrounded by darkness. SubhanAllah. What a system Allah has made. What a nizam Allah has created. And we'll see that this imagery is then going to build on top. Final comment on this makanu ya'malun, what they have been doing. I briefly mentioned this to you. People are habituated. They keep doing the same thing over and over again. And they're like, this is how it's supposed to be. This is how we're supposed to do it. <coughs> and that is what Allah has captured in makanu ya'malun. When you do the same thing over and over again, you become comfortable doing the same thing, even if it's harmful to you. Think of uh, addictions like smoking, for example. You keep doing it, you keep doing it, you keep doing it. Even though if it's bad, it has no purpose. It doesn't benefit you, it only harms you. But you're going to keep doing it because it's, a, it's been beautified to you in your mind. Right? So, زُيِّنَ لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Their pre-existing habits have been beautified for them. And that's the contrast between them and the one who finds light, the one whose seed pops open and they seek light. They, they leave their past behind. They leave the dead state behind. And they're able to emerge a new thing altogether. Someone who finds Allah, someone who finds guidance, it's like they were recreated. It's like they're, they're not even the same person anymore. That was, that was something dead, this is something alive. That was a seed, this is a tree, subhanAllah. May Allah Azza wa keep all of our faiths alive and may Allah Azza wa allow us to become a means by which others who are seeking the faith will find this truth. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikil hakim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh Assalamu alaikum everyone. There are almost 50,000 students around the world that are interested on top of the students we have in studying the Quran and its meanings and being able to learn that and share that with family and friends. And they need sponsorships, which is not very expensive. So if you can help sponsor students on Bayina TV, please do so and visit our sponsorship page. I appreciate it so much and pray that Allah gives our mission success and we're able to share the meanings of the Quran and the beauty of it the world over.